Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sean Buckley, Chief Revenue Officer for Connected TV at Magnite. Thank you for attending today's episode of Magnite's TV 100 series, Timeless TV and Why Great Creative Endures. We're happy to have you here. Just a little bit about Magnite's TV 100. It's a curated thought leadership series focused on providing insights into television's constant evolution. In front of our screens, we learn, we imagine, we laugh, we play, we escape, we might even fall in love with the creative before us. The people you'll be hearing from today have helped us do just that. They and we have one thing in common. We love TV in all of its machinations and forms, and it's constantly evol evolving and intriguing history. TV is still king because it is truly timeless. For instance, Gen Z has discovered iconic shows from the 50s and 60s, like I Love Lucy and the original Star Trek series, right along with anything else that it's streaming now because great creative endures no matter when it was conceived. Today, think of our timeless TV session as more of an intimate fireside chat, exploring how special legacy programs continually reinvent themselves to keep pace with TV's changing face and various formats for entertainment, news, and advertising alike. It's gonna be a fantastic discussion. If you have any questions for the panelists, please type them into the Zoom Q&A box and we'll try to get to as many as possible. And now I'd like to introduce the moderator of today's episode and MediaLink's vice chair, Wenda Harris-Millard. And I'll just say a few words about Wenda. Wenda is a media and marketing executive with over 20 years in magazine publishing at Family Circle, Ladies Home Journal, and New York Magazine. She's also a digital advertising pioneer, serving on the founding executive team of DoubleClick and holding roles as chief sales officer for Yahoo and C CEO of Martha Stewart Omni Omnimedia. Wenda is the recipient of numerous awards, including Advertising Person of the Year and 100 Most Influential Women in Advertising. In April 2022, she'll be inducted into the Advertising Hall of Fame, the industry's highest honor. Wenda holds a bachelor's from Trinity College in Hartford and an MBA from Harvard Business School. With that, I'll pass the mic to Wenda. Well, hi everybody. I am just so thrilled to be here with you today and very excited to facilitate what I promise you will be a very lively discussion. It is undeniable that television, the good, the bad, and the everything in between serves as a significant cultural driver around the world. As a medium, it can incite curiosity, fuel imaginations, encourage learning, stir emotions, and galvanize communities of millions of viewers around common interests. And while the way we consume TV programs has changed with constantly evolving technology, one thing remains constant. Powerful storytelling and great creative will always endure. Our two guests today understand that implicitly, which is why their respective portfolio of work stands the test of time. And speaking of time, I wish I had more of it to list out all of their incredible achievements and accolades, but with so much to dig into during our discussion, please accept my abridged version. Mike Reese has won four Emmys and a Peabody Award during his 26 years writing for The Simpsons, the longest running animated show in television history. He was showrunner in season four, which Entertainment Weekly called the greatest season of the greatest show in history. In 2006, he received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Animation Writers Caucus. Mike also co-created the animated series The Critic and Showtime's hit cartoon Queer Duck, which was named one of the 100 greatest cartoons of all time by the BBC. Some of Mike's other TV credits include its Gary Shandling show, ALF, and The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. He has been a contributing writer for more than two dozen beloved animated films with a collective worldwide gross of a whopping $8 billion. Welcome to Mike. Ross Martin is an Emmy and Peabody award-winning marketing and business innovation leader. He is president of Gnome, Gnome, which was named the 2020 Global Agency of the Year. Known combines science, strategy, and award-winning creative to support clients like TikTok, Sesame Street, the NBA, and many others. As the former Executive Vice President of Marketing Strategy and Engagement for Viacom, he oversaw global and domestic marketing, consumer intelligence, data science, and creative innovation, and served as chairman of the Viacom Marketing Council. 
He also founded and ran Scratch, Viacom's creative strategy and consulting division, and he was the first head of programming for MTV's College Network. Ross's industry distinctions include Fast Company's 100 Most Creative People in Business, Fortune's 40 Under 40 Top Business Leaders, and Adweek's 50 Most Indispensable Executives in Advertising. In 2014, he was inducted into the Advertising Hall of Achievement, and did I mention he is also an acclaimed poet. How about that? Welcome, Ross. Well, all right, gentlemen, I can think of no duo better to join me in this conversation about the future of television than you. So I think this is going to be just, just so much fun. Let's dive in. To kick things off, I'm curious to know, what are you currently watching on TV? There's a show I love called uh, How To with John Wilson. And I think this is this genius show on HBO. I've never heard about it anywhere, never seen it written up. Uh, and it just shows you there's great stuff in and among the 8,000 things that are being shown on TV right now. Well, I well, love Mike that. Ross, what are you watching? I can represent the scripted stuff because I'm not gonna. I, I, I'm embarrassed to even say what I watch. But I, on the unscripted side, um, I will tell you. And this is such an example of what is old is still new again. My favorite show on television is Family Feud because it's literally data science as a TV show. It is, um, and it's sort of like a referendum on where we are in culture. Uh, so I find it to be the best show on television. And then the other is like the most, um, I don't know, basic it appeals to like your your mortal fear is mixed martial arts, watching UFC fighters bash each other on television. And I feel like a caveman for saying that, but that's fine. I, I'll be the caveman on the panel. I love it. Absolutely love it. So let me ask you one other sort of starter question. Now, where do you mostly watch your television in other words what what device what platform um where are you consuming it i'm well, I go old first school one. i watch like, tv I just, I, I, go ahead i just watch tv on the tv i'm uh i'm old on the tv <laughs> yeah well Retro. i guess i'm new school <laughs> i don't know i don't know i guess i'm new school like i i, I when you say tv i'm like that word doesn't what does it mean anymore? <laughs> right? What is I'm it like, the content? Is it the device? I know. Is this a TV? Because yeah. to me, it is like wherever I go, that's my TV. So on my phone is where I watch almost everything. It's a killer because yeah. TV has never looked better. You know, they just have the, the, you know, they cut it so beautifully, they light it so beautifully, and you're looking at it on this, you're looking at it on a, a brick, basically. Right. Well, I think the good news is that there's more consumption than ever before because of that mobility. But um, I, I hear you. Uh, Mike, something that you said about the, um, you know, sort of thousands and thousands of shows and, you know, channel surfing used to be a major part of the of the television viewing experience. But um, given all of these streaming environments, that that seems to be be a challenge. So when you are writing and producing, how, how do you take into account the fact that, you know, we have all these different devices and platforms um, where people are consuming the content? How, how do you, when you're, when you're writing um, and producing, how do you think about that? I'm, I'm going to give you, I mean, I've spent 32 years on The Simpsons. I don't have a broad experience. It's been 32 years there. I presume I'm going to die there and I will continue <laughs> to collect a paycheck for a couple of years after that because nobody really expects that much out of me anymore. But I, I want to jump all the way back just for a little story, which was two weeks before The Simpsons came on the air. I'm sitting in the trailer with the other writers. And that tells you something right there that we were in a trailer, you know. Fox couldn't even commit a room to us. They had so little faith in the show. And I said, how long do you think this show's gonna last? And every writer in the room said, six weeks. Six weeks, six weeks, six weeks. The most confident man in the room was Sam Simon, one of the creators. He said, I think it'll go 13 weeks, but don't worry, no one's gonna see it. It won't hurt your career. 
And <laughs> it's great. a cute, ironic story, but I think it also goes toward why the show became a success. We thought nobody was going to watch it. So instead of making the kind of show we saw on TV, we said, let's make the kind of show we always wanted to see on TV. Let's just do it for us. And, uh, and because we only thought we had six weeks, even though we made 13 episodes, we said, we better make it move fast because we're not going to have this opportunity for long. And that's underscored uh, uh, probably every question you're going to ask about The Simpsons. It's the same answer, which was, it's an internet, it's a hit in 71 countries. We have no idea why. It's gigantic in India. We don't know what they're getting out of it. We, we don't think about them. We don't think about them. We don't know. They love it in Iran. And we don't know why, how they get our jokes in Tehran. We don't know how they get our jokes in <laughs> Texas. We are just, we, we are just trying to please ourselves, and that seems to have worked not only internationally, but on all platforms. And for, you know, 32 years of different viewing styles and approaches. So, Mike, I, th I think that's really interesting because I, I was thinking about, you know, the, the extraordinary number of countries um, in which the the Simpsons is is so available, so so the writers don't take that into account as we as only, working on the show. We don't not only don't consider it, we don't even know about it. I went to a trip to Russia, and I was mobbed by paparazzi, and they had eight by ten glossies <laughs> of me. I go, I don't even have that. Where did you get that? And and the people at the show had no idea how popular it is there. I, I have a quick story. I was in a bar in Malaysia, and the bartender says to me, he said, Homer Simpson is a very Malaysian father. And I, I said, yeah, that's what we're going for. And, and five minutes later, a Danish tourist came up to me, and he goes, you know, the Simpsons have a very Danish sense of humor. And, and I was really shocked to hear the Danish have a sense of humor. That, you know what? You have to stop wearing that yellow shirt. You're going to get mobbed everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Ross, I have a, a, a question for you. Um, you know, because if, if you know, th this is very interesting in terms of the um, sort of doing it for yourself, um, you know, when you're a writer and you don't necessarily, um, as Mike just said, you don't have to account, you know, for, for all of, you know, this, this noise um, and all those complications but um you know you you cut your teeth uh in programming and and development so how did how did those earlier years um influence your approach when it comes to marketing because you know so many many of us who are are in that world you don't market um to the russians and the iranians you know and and the danish um the same way. So how, how did all of those years that you spent on the production side, how has that influenced your, your approach when it when it comes to marketing? Well, first, I would say I do have a, an eight by 10 glossy of Mike in my bedroom. <laughs> so I don't know why other <laughs> don't have that here. Um, but anyway, uh, so look, it, being a producer only made me more audience centered. Um, and I'll tell you the moment that it happened for me. Um, one of our networks at the time, MTV, which was run at the time by Tony DeSanto and Van Toffler, had a big show, you may have heard of it, called The Hills, right? So The Hills ran for like a decade. Yeah. The, the, the thing that was constant in the audience feedback from The Hills was, is it real? And nobody could ever answer, none of us wanted to answer that question. I won't even answer that question here. But let me tell you, because I'll get in trouble. But let me tell you what happened in the last scene Two of the main characters have to say goodbye to each other, and it's a metaphor because they're saying goodbye to the audience. It's the end of the, the show, and it's never coming back. And they kiss. And as they kiss, in the background, we had the, the crew pull apart, like the fake trees, the fake buildings, and you're like, oh my God, this whole thing was fake the whole time. It was all <laughs> scripted. None of it was real. We shot it that way. We also shot it the other way. And now it's like hours before the finale and you have to decide, are we gonna show them 
the version that looks unscripted? Or are we going to pull this back and reveal that we wrote the whole thing and it was all scripted all the time? And so that was a tough call. And I got to be in the room for that. And no matter which way you go, and we've never talked about this publicly, so I'm breaking news here. And no matter which way you go, you're, you're right and you're also wrong. And so we went both ways. You know, we, we put it out one way and then the next week made you tune back in because you heard there was another way and you had to watch it all over again. And that's when I learned the power of the audience to decide for you what actually matters. So, you know, I'm just thinking about, about you know, maybe the difference. Uh, I mean, you, you've marketed shows like South Park and Daily Show, um, but you also have consulted and continue uh, to consult with known um, major brand brand marketers. So there have to be a lot of similarities, I think, to, to marketing for a programming series and marketing to a brand. But there's also got to be a lot of differences I would think. And that story about the hills, it kind of re reminded me um, to ask you about that. So when you think about a series, marketing a series, marketing a brand, um, what are some of the similarities? And then again, some of the differences. I think the whole thing comes down to the drivers of brand preference and the, you know, the emotional expectations of an audience. Um, South Park and The Simpsons are great examples because in both cases, you've got many, many, many generations besides geographies, three, four generations of fans, the fans that weren't even born when Mike started creating the show um, and actually probably weren't even alive for the finale. Um, and who are now discovering it for the first time, just as they are Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And our job is to mm -hmm. understand drivers of dis you know, discovery and brand preference and to be able to break down the cohorts and the micro segments of viewers, or in the case of a brand, consumers, to be able to sort of turn something on in them, in their head and in their heart, that makes them compelled to watch or to buy. It's the same thing every time. And um, I think my, you know, Mike's being like, you know, not giving himself enough credit, but like what he has done for decades is uh, understand central human truths, just like the best brands in the world. When you watch The Simpsons, you know that it's just so true. Or if it's not true yet, they predict the future, so it will be true in a few <laughs> years. And, and it's, it, but it's the same things with the best brands in the world. They're speaking to something that just like a cello resonates with your soul and you feel it, you may not understand what it is you're feeling, you may not be able to talk about it, but you know you're compelled. Wow. So, so well, Mike, let's, let's you, talk about did that. You, for, uh, wait, I gotta interrupt. It's just, I think Ross mentioned the finale of The Simpsons, which scares the hell out of me because I was just there yesterday and uh, oh, we're the still last making them. Oh, the last but it's, this is how you find out. So anyway, uh, so, I wanted to just mention something. More, like, yeah, you still have to make more. <laughs> I got to make more. Okay. Uh, um, I just want to talk one one time about uh, streaming TV and content creation, where I don't watch a lot of streaming because everything's serialized. Everything is just here, you're yeah. in there, and then we want to hook you, and you're bored, and then something happens right at the end. I got to watch another one. and. It become the, the streaming services have become like tobacco companies. We're just gonna get you hooked on this thing. You're gonna regret doing it, but you're gonna hang in there. And I don't think that's a good, you know, I don't love tobacco companies either, but I don't think that's a great way to make TV. I don't think it's a good, and I see it underscoring more and more of what they're creating. And meanwhile, you got The Simpsons. I hate to keep coming back to my show. And I know, I know we're not, always great and every once in a while we put out a bad decade but still you know the simpsons doesn't fit the brand of what's on streaming tv it's not serialized you can watch them in any order but on disney plus right now they got 700 episodes and it's their highest rated thing the simpsons is bigger than marvel and bigger than star wars on disney and bigger than all the pixar stuff and it doesn't fit the mold. And in fact, what I, I heard is if you watch one episode of The Simpsons, you will wind up watching a hundred episodes of The Simpsons. And that's, by the way, too many. You shouldn't do that. But uh, 
<laughs> but so that's it. We're all we're doing is just making it, trying to trying to make a good show one at a time. And there's none of these tricks involved to keep people hooked and to go from one episode to the next to the next. And the shows I like on streaming all fit that bill, whether it's uh, the one I mentioned, How To with John Wilson, or several different sketch shows. Uh, it's episodic is still okay. You know, you can trust people to just try to make something good instead of make something addictive. Wendy, if I may. So, so, yeah, please. I don't, I'm only slightly disagreeing with Mike because I don't mind my, myself and my 12 year old have a crack like addiction to anything Mark Pedowitz puts on the CW, right? So like I watch stuff that's age not, not appropriate for me. Like it's like the flash for 12, <laughs> love it. but I, I watch and I'm hooked just like I was when I grew up watching Batman and he's all tied up by, you know, the penguin and you go to commercial, of course, I'm going to come back and I'm going to come for the next episode too. But I don't know. I mean, I find that the quality of TV, right? Like not just animation, but look at what's happening on the CW and not to show for them, but it's extraordinary. Like, I can't believe I'm watching a half hour or an hour show that's made, you know, you're making 23 of these a season. The production value is unbelievable. And it would just be, we, I think we'd be remiss to like not point out how far the, 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 the technology has come. The other part of this that is like crack-like is there are tricks or tropes, as I prefer to say, to getting people to watch more. There were shows, for example, at when I was at Viacom that we were marketing that we, we would actually use, if we knew a show like Younger on TV Land uh, was a hit show, which it was a surprise hit. Um, we, we knew that if the weather was going to be bad, we would track a hurricane coming up the East Coast and we'd hit you with programming messages to say like, well, look, like you're going to be stuck in your house for the next 48 hours. We're premiering a new episode of Younger. If we knew just like Mike knows that if you watched one episode of that show or one episode of like your new favorite show, you're going to watch 50. And if we know you're going to be at your house that whole time, because we can actually see that you're online using your ISP, like we know we're going to market to you and we have a good chance of you binging. So I just want, I want to um, thank, thank you for that, Ross. That, that was terrific. Mike, I want to get back to something that Ross said before um, about you and your team having this, you know, almost uncanny ability to consistently have your finger on the pulse of um, the human experience amid, you know, extraordinary changes in our, in our cultural conversations uh, as a society at large. And, you know, he also mentioned the point that, that it almost seems sometimes that you're predicting the future. So is it, you know, you're, you're so casual and easy in, in talking about it, but is it, is it really just that natural? You're not working hard at, at trying to keep pace with or, or, or keep ahead of the 24 seven news cycle. I mean, would you, would you say it's just, it's natural? It's, it's very, very hard work. We work really hard. Uh, somebody said, and in fact, it was the showrunner, Al Jean, said people can say the show's not what it used to be, it's not as good as it was, or that was a bad episode, but no one can say we didn't work as hard as we could on every single episode. And that motivates us. And it's funny, The Simpsons is a show based on human stupidity. It's a uh, I think it, it's as long as people do stupid things, we will keep having episodes. And in fact, that I you know, think it will it, never end. Well, that was it. There's, there's an, it's, it sounds like a joke. It's a true story because the dumber people, and when things are kind of good in America, that's when I think the show starts to suffer because where, you know, there's not a lot to feed off of. But the night, uh, I hate to get political, the night, Donald Trump was elected. He was elected November 8th, 2016. On November 9th, Fox called us and said, we're picking you up for two more years. And I thought, oh, no. wow, he really is a job oh. creator. So, so that's it. We, 
So I do think that now the predicting thing, just very quickly, I see our time is ticking down. We basically, we've done, I, I did the math. We've done 72,000 jokes on The Simpsons over the past 32 years, 72,000 jokes. Three of them have come true. Three things, we get one thing right a decade, which makes us some of the best psychics in America. So we predicted that America would win the gold medal in Olympic curling. And it's like, who cares? And we predicted that Brazil would cheat at World Cup soccer. And of, who didn't know that? And we predicted President Trump. We predicted it in the year 2000. And I remember the moment where it was just, we were sitting in the room 16 years before he was elected and the setup was, what's the dumbest thing we can imagine America doing? And someone said, President Trump. And we all laughed and we laughed so much. Oh. But the amazing moment was, I remember after that, the writer's assistant sitting at the keyboard, before she typed it into the script, she turned to us and she goes, do you think that's too dumb? Oh boy. <laughs> Oh my goodness, too, too funny. Well, we, we could ask so, so many, many questions, but believe it or not, um, it's almost time for, for audience questions. But before those come up, um, let me just ask you one, one question. So since we know we're going to be having this conversation again for, for 10 years, because Mike will, will continue to be writing for um, The Simpsons, I think that, that's now very, very clear. Um, and Ross, with your background, we know you'll be around. Um, so if we have this conversation again in 10 years um, about the future of television, what do you think we're gonna be talking about? The issues are gonna be different. What do you think they might be? Or maybe the issues won't be different. I'm gonna say something terrible. I put off saying this for a while. The, the streaming services, the older streaming services, I felt like they went from genius to junk faster than anyone since Chevy Chase. I think the older ones just, just went, you know, just a couple of years ago, uh, you know, Amazon said, Spike Lee, you want to make a movie in verse? Okay. You know, Martin Scorsese, you want to make a five hour movie, star it with Italians and call it The Irishman? cool whatever you want and now they've they've settled into being like the networks and that a lot of it has gotten so formulaic everyone everything i tune in is just people running from the mob it's nice tv stars running from the <laughs> irish mob and the black mob and the russian mob and you know they're gonna run out of mobs and then i don't know what they're gonna do but that's it i'm, I'm afraid very quickly uh, they're getting to be like the things they replace, like network TV. And I hope that doesn't happen. Or I think in 10 years, there's going to be yet three more ways to watch uh, entertainment. Fantastic. Ross, 10 years from now when we reconvene, what, what are we going to be talking about? I don't think it's quite as dystopian as maybe Mike <laughs> believes. I would, I would just argue that a couple of things. One, um, which is a little scary to say, I, I think American media companies will not be run by or owned by Americans, um, and I think that's that's sort of hard to conceive today. But um, but just imagine it. And the other is that I think, um, and this is a little more optimistic, that we will truly be our own heads of programming. Uh, and that these these walls, these subscription models, they will all sort of sort of be less important than before, and users will have more control, and things will be simpler and easier to navigate. Just in the course of the pandemic, we've gone from Americans subscribing to three streaming services to four, and they don't buy stream streaming services subscriptions; they rent streaming services because as soon as they're done with them, they toss them for the next one. And they base those decisions mostly on price and content today. And so I think those things are gonna kind of get worked out over the next decade, or at least I hope to God they are. And um, it'll be a lot easier for people to find exactly what they want and line it up and watch it without any boundaries. Russ, can I ask, do people actually do that? It's, it would be very heartening to hear. Do, do people get a subscription service and bail or, did they just get in the habit and keep it there? Oh, okay. 
No, loyalty, loyalty is not there. It's like, let me get what I need and want out of that service and then um, either convince me to stay or I'm gone for the better price than the next content the, that the library that I haven't seen yet. Uh, and so it's getting super competitive and you're, you're seeing all the streamers that used to be able to take binging for granted uh, now have to work harder to get attention. Great. Great. So we have some, some audience questions. Um, first one that, that pops up, uh, have you ever been asked to compromise your creative integrity in order to satisfy a sponsor, a, a brand? Um, I, I, either one of you guys. Uh, Simpsons obviously has been on, spend its life on Fox and we do nothing but make fun of Fox. And we don't make <laughs> fun of Fox because we want to be sassy and irreverent. We want to, we make fun of Fox because we think they're kind of evil. So, and they're fine with that. It is a, a you know, they are capitalists and they like the money we bring into Fox and Rupert Murdoch, even though he, he doesn't agree with us politically, I think has been a guest on our show two or three times. And in one episode, we had him eating a rat and he was fine with that. And we're now we're at Fox and Disney and uh, Disney could have been greater. You know, they could have tried to tamp us down or mold us to their brand, but instead they like having us as sort of the bad boys in the tent. And the only thing they asked is, they said no smoking on the show, no smoking. And, you know, no. we have two characters, Patty and Selma, that's their character. They smoke, uh, but we were willing to do that. Otherwise, I, I, I think we all could not be happier at Disney. I think I learned um, this lesson best from uh, two heroes that I, I got to know a little bit, um, Stephen Colbert and John Stewart, um, who you know have their own systems of belief, uh, and they also they know who they are, um, and they have the courage of their conviction. And there were lines that they would draw in their shows and things they weren't willing to do. Um, and uh, and so so I learned that, and as a programmer, a producer, and, and as a marketer. I've learned very quickly that there are you can you should um, size up the values of whoever you're working with um, and and make a quick decision about whether they align with your own or not. And it's not just you know I run a company that's almost 500 people. It's not just what I think. Um, the power of the team that I work for, essentially, of people who do the work um, at Known, they're they're not about to you know wake up in the morning and dedicate themselves creatively or on the science side or strategy to anything that doesn't align with their values. Um, and that's just a no-go. And it's never been more true than ever before. So have I been asked to compromise my values? Hell yes, for 25 years. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes yeah. I've made the mistake of not having the courage of my convictions. But most of the time, yeah. And people look at you and either want to work with you because you can do that or want to stay away from you because you don't. There you go. Now, another question, um, your top three criteria when it comes to outstanding television creative, and has that changed o over time um, for, for both of you? I got nothing on this. <laughs> You're yeah, just steady, steady Eddie. What do you think <laughs> about when you think about great creative, Ross? I, it's only one thing. Uh, it's make people feel something. Make people feel something. It's like Ellie Wiesel said, like the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is indifference. And indifference is the enemy of any television producer or creator. Mm -hmm. you, if, you, if you actually, you, you know, they may hate you, they may love you, but it, it, if, they, if they do neither of those things, you're in trouble. So, your your agency um, known. You recently produced Ross one of the um, Super Bowl twenty twenty one uh, commercial spots for Shift Four's uh, announcement about the the first all civilian mission um, to space. So when you think about all the the media options that we have, what what propels the staying power of premium TV placements? You know, we've talked a lot about the programming. But what about the actual TV placements? What makes those sticky? 
I think that's an amazing question um, because here's the thing: if 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 you leave here having watched this and think if you if you're going to think any differently about television than you did before this panel, it would just be to say that TV's not dumb anymore, right? Like that dumb pipe that's coming into your house and that big screen on your wall, it's not as stupid as it was before. Um, and so as we redefine what TV means and we decide that anything with glass and an image behind it is a television, um, that mm -hmm. old school TV at your house um, is smarter. Um, it's learning to anticipate what you need um, and what you want from it. And so, um, Let's also remember that in this country and around the world, there are hundreds of millions of people who don't have access to streaming uh, and other technologies on their phones and computers and, and, and um, tablets. Um, and there are um, so many consumers that are spending still so much time watching television, especially when there's urgency or there's an event. Um, and that goes for news mm -hmm. um, and, it go for, and it goes for live sports. And you continue to see, I mean, not all shows when they premiere each week are an event like The Simpsons. Mike's been able to do something that almost no one in the history of television has been able to do for as long as he's been able to do it. Outside of some incredible anomalies like that, big tentpole, tentpole events and live sports uh, still draw hundreds of millions of American consumers and they matter and they make a big difference. So just sticking with um, the commercial aspect for, for a minute, one of the uh, questions from our audience members, are there any TV commercials that stand out to you as being very memorable or effective? And Mike, this is for, for you as well, even though that's not your um, your forte, but certainly there are commercials, you know, in, in your shows. Um, are there, are there absolutely great ones that you think of as being for the long term? There's all the classic. I mean, uh, I, 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 when you make a question like that, I immediately think of the old, uh, 1984, uh, mm -hmm. my Mac, uh, Mac commercial. I, you know, there are uh, there are those great ads, the great ads that are little movies or are funny, you know. That, yeah. um, but they, uh, I don't know. I've I've heard from my brother who has an MBA and actually did something with his life that uh, those don't always sell things. What sells yeah, things right. in commercials are the bad commercials where they just have that just have that catchphrase they say over and over. A cat or they have the name of the product and a buzzer. I remember there was something oh, called yeah. Biz, Biz Detergent. We biz bag. We don't biz bag. <laughs> there was a buzzer going off. And, you know, here I am. I'm still traumatized by it 45 years later. So I love the good ads. And I, I got to say the ad that worked is the uh, a, a big advertiser on The Simpsons is Olive Garden. And, yes. you know, I know. I had no plans to eat at Olive Garden, but four months of lockdown, just watching Olive Garden ads, it was the first thing I did when New York opened up. I <laughs> ran out to the Olive Garden to get shrimp tortellini, which is what they had been pushing, and I'm allergic to shrimp, but that's, I guess, a good ad. <laughs> that's a very good ad. <laughs> Ross, what do you think of? <laughs> I, I <laughs> I love that, that we're talking about this question because on the one hand, like we can all think about the creative that has moved us, that we remember. Um, but what I'm, what I'm most interested in in my job as a marketer is did, did the spot, did the campaign do its job? Not for the agency, but as Mike said, did it do the job for Olive Garden? Did it do the job for the brand that you work for um, who bought that media? and whose message you're you're trying to convey and so i don't know if you ask me and i'm going to curse so i'm sorry you can bleep me out it the, the things that really stand out to me as a storyteller and i would imagine to mike and other creators um would be shit that fucks with the medium right shit that fucks with the medium of television is shit that moves us forward um creatively and, and often when it's done really well um in business and i look at what reddit did last year with just five seconds of local ad time and just did the whole thing that made you go like what the hell was that and you had to go to reddit to figure out what that was and it sort of caused an action 
The same thing is the work that we did with TikTok last year. It was TikTok's first ever brand campaign. TikTok was under attack in this country and all over the world, both from regulators, governments, and from competitors like Facebook. And what we were able to do four nights and five nights in a row was take something that was happening on the platform, in that case, Ocean Spray and Dogface, riding, listening to Fleetwood Mac, and turn it into a campaign within hours, put it up in prime time, and the next morning, wake up to see that hundreds of thousands of people had not only seen it, but then imitated it. it. So the campaign itself, which built brand love for TikTok and for the characters in the spot, cre created or generated a, a response. And within hours, we took that response and re-trafficked new creative back onto television in prime time that night. And then did it again and again. And nobody could believe, in TikTok's credit, nobody could believe that somebody was able to make new spots that fast and traffic them back on national television in prime time within hours. So that's a campaign, that's a marketing flywheel that did its job. Was the creative the best creative in the world? No, it was good, it was the best, no, but it did its job because it created more and more TikTok and more brand love for TikTok along the way. And it fucked with the medium itself. So that's a social network using old television to do something new. Well, here's what I would say. I think this morning in these very, very, very fast 45 minutes, we have created brand love, brand love for Mike Reese and <laughs> for Ron. Um, I, I think this was just some of the most most fun conversations I've had um, in a while. And I'm, I'm so sorry to end it, but I wanna thank both of you um, so much for joining me this morning. And now we have to turn it back to Sean. Wow, what a great session. So, so interesting. Um, that does wrap up our latest episode of TV 100. Our thanks to Wenda, Mike and Ross for all of that creative knowledge. We'd also like to thank all of you for attending and sharing this series with us and the insight and experience uh, of our panel experts. We hope you've had as much fun delving into this topic as we've had exploring what may be coming next for the future of TV in all of its amazing forms. We look forward to seeing you for our next episode in this series, but until then, have a great day, everyone.